Trino's Choice, Chapter 5, The Book Basket. Trino didn't look back. What if Roska and the others came around the store to cut him off? From the parking lot, Trino ran back towards his neighborhood, only to suddenly turn and run in another direction as Roska's threat drummed inside his head. This isn't over, man. I know where you sleep. Trino couldn't go home right now. He'd be all alone. So Trino ran several blocks, dodging old cars left to rust in the street, jumping over broken branches or trash bags blocking sidewalks. He ignored barking dogs and the old man sitting in his undershirt on the porch of a house, yelling out curses in Spanish. Trino's body felt ready to pop open and spill his guts everywhere by the time he decided no one was after him. He slowed his pace, then finally stopped running. By then, the familiar part of his vario was behind him, and all he could do was walk the same deserted places he had run past yesterday. Fear had controlled everything then. He had been so busy running and hiding that nothing else had mattered. Today, he had time to think about how thirsty he felt and how fast a bowl of cereal had disappeared inside his stomach, leaving only hungry, leaving only hungry, hunger in its place. And he had no money to get something to eat. Trino kicked at the dirt road, only to have a sudden gust of wind blow the dirt into his face. He paused to rub the dust from his eyes with the bottom of his black t-shirt. As he opened them, he saw a blurry set of shops in the distance. He almost smiled when he saw, saw it, the book basket. The corner shop still looked junky, but Trino knew it was cool inside. It probably had a water fountain or at least a bathroom sink. Suddenly, yesterday's events came back more clearly. Trino remembered the book lady saying she'd have food for people who came to hear some man read poems. She had said he was coming at three o'clock. What time was it? As he walked towards the area, he noticed there were about a dozen cars in the dirt lot in front of the shops. He looked around, trying to decide what to do. If all these people were in the bookstore, he might not get much food anyway. If the place was real empty, he couldn't just walk in and grab some food without the book lady saying something. He moved under a mesquite tree and watched the bookstore a while longer, wishing the place didn't have so much stuff in the front windows. Trino couldn't see anything. He ignored the rumbling of bus brakes behind him. He stared harder through the window, still not certain if he should stay or just leave. A group of voices, all talking at the same time, made Trino turn around. The blue and white striped city bus had just let off two girls and three boys. They were heading in Trino's direction. A hint of relief made Trino's body relax. He recognized the group of kids from yesterday. All he could remember of them was Lasana's name. He leaned against the mesquite tree, grabbing a couple of dry beans off the low branches to crack with his fingers. The two girls offered him a smile, but he only gave a little one to Lasana in return. Hi, you came back. Lasana's brown eyes were shiny as she spoke to him. Trino, right? Yeah, he answered. He didn't know what else to say. He just looked at her quickly, noticing the plain pink t-shirt and blue jeans she wore. The other kids were dressed like him in t-shirts and jeans. Nobody would know he wasn't with them, that he didn't come for any other reason than some free food. Well, Trino, I'm Janie. This annou announcement came from the other girl. Trino noticed the ugly green nail polish right away because the girl started flapping her hands as soon as she opened her mouth and never closed it. That's Albert and Hector, and this guy's Jimmy. He's Lasana's brother. Can't tell they're twins, can you? Nobody ever guesses. Did you come back to see the poetry man? 
I don't know much about poetry, but Maggie always puts some great cookies and sandwiches out when she has a writer come to the store. If she didn't have food, Albert and Hector wouldn't even show up. She pointed out the boys beside her. Shut up, Janie, Albert said, dragging the words out. He was a skinny kid with a circle of straight black hair hanging over a shaved area around the ears. Let's go inside. It's hot out here. Come on, Trino. We'll show you the best place to sit, Janie said, giving Trino a smile with a lot of crooked teeth showing. If you don't sit close, some fat lady steps in front of you or a tall guy gets in your way and you can't see anything. That happened to us last time, right, Lasana? You remember that guy with the little red hat that smelled like cigars? Bleh. Tr Trino hated girls who talked a mile about nothing. He stared at Lasana, not moving one step until he knew what, was go what she was going to do. Lasana shrugged at Trino, then grabbed Janie's arm and tugged the girl along. Albert's right. Let's go inside. Silently, Trino walked behind the guys. There wasn't much to say. They were nothing like him, even if they too had come for the free food. When Trino stepped inside behind the others, he noticed the cool air first. Immediately, his sweaty back seemed to drop away from his shirt. Then he saw that the front room wasn't just a dim place with jalapeno-shaped lights. Curtains on a large side window had been drawn back and lightened the room considerably. He hadn't even realized there were any windows before, but as he followed Lasana and her friends, he saw the curtains open on several small back windows in each room they went through. Today, there were other people around. A lady with two kids about Beto's age were pulling books down from the shelves and looking at them. Three college-age women with longish hair and round little glasses on their noses were laughing in the corner of another room. Two men who looked like teachers and several other women who looked like sour-faced principals were also looking around at books. Visualize. Trino was a little surprised when he got to the back room. The shopping cart of books was gone, and so were the orange crates. The racks had been pushed back against the shelves. It looked more crowded, even though Trino knew some stuff had been taken out. However, there was a larger space in the center of the room now. A blue carpet with crooked red designs was spread on the floor, along with the red bean bags and two big black pillows. Behind the rug, there were six metal folding chairs. Trino didn't see any food any place. Dumb idea to be here at all. He shifted his steps backwards, slowly moving out of the room, but then a pair of women came down the ramp, bumping him back toward the girls. He barely missed stomping on Lasana's feet before he could even mumble sorry. Two tall men in weird-looking shirts with sleeves that didn't even match each other came into the room. Those three college types came in after them. A short man and a woman with ribbons braided through her long black hair came into the room behind them. Are we the only kids here, Trino said. He hadn't realized he had spoken the words out loud until he heard Lasana laugh. Doesn't matter. She turned around to face him. Have you ever been to a poetry reading? Trino shook his head. Not me. A writer came to my old school once, but... What she read made no sense to me, Lasana said, talking about soldiers and windmills in some place. I like books about things I know. That's why I like Maggie's store. She has good books about people like us. People like us? Trino shoved his hands into his pockets. Who'd want to read that? So what kind of books do you like? Lasana pushed some of her black hair from her face. She continued to look at Trino as she spoke. She talked so easy to him, but his words came out slow and stiff. I don't know. Same kind as you, I guess. Lasana laughed again before she said, Do you really like to read, or are you just telling me that? I read, Trino answered quickly. He just hoped she wasn't going to ask him to give her a book report or anything. Oh, yeah? Lasana studied his face 
as if she was trying to see the truth. Only it didn't matter because suddenly Janie said, wow, look at Maggie. He turned around to see the book lady coming into the room with another man. The book lady's red hair looked shiny even though it, it spread out in all directions. Like fire burning up an empty lot. Her blue eyes were rimmed in black and she had pink smears on her cheeks. She wore a many colored scarf over a green dress. Visualize the belt around her waist looked like gold nickels strung on a chain. Emil say is here, the book lady said in a loud voice. Why don't you all find a place to sit? The guy wore heeled black boots, baggy blue jeans, and a blue and white striped shirt. His hair was like black straw with the thick braid hanging down his back. When he turned around to face everyone, Trina saw the man wore a turquoise stud in one ear. His face was dark brown and his nose looked like he had lost a few fights in his life. Trino guessed the man was in his 30s. He's not a hunk, is he? Trino heard Janie whisper to Lasana. What did you expect? Some guy from a telenovela? One of the boys said just loud enough for Trino to hear. Trino stiffened when Lasana's soft finger circled his wrist. It was like when Beto would try to get Trino's hand before they crossed the street. Often Trino pulled away from his little brother's hand, but Lasana's touch didn't embarrass him. It had only taken him by surprise. Come on, she said. Let's get closer to the front. Trino really wanted to stay right where he was, near the way to go out. But everybody started crowding around. Better to find some place away from all the weird people in the room and sit with Aslana said. Janie and the other boys had moved to a corner of the blue carpet near the flower table. Trino had always hated being near the front. It meant that teachers called on you first. Would it be like that in this place too? Once Lissana sat down, Trino moved as far behind her as he could until the bookshelves poked his back. He relaxed a little when some old lady pulled one of the metal chairs up on the carpet near them. He could just hide behind her chair and hope nobody would notice if he fell asleep. He expected to be bored when the book lady started talking, but Trino felt curious about the man. The book lady had said that Emilio Montoya's parents were migrant workers. Montoya had spent a little time in prison, and now he was a college teacher. Montoya's black gaze moved over the people in the room as if he was trying to figure out what they were thinking. Immediately, Trino lowered his head. Rosca's rat face. Mr. Epifano's bleeding face, Beto's sad face, and Emilio Montoya's gaze all mixed together in Trino's thoughts. Visualize. Suddenly, a dark, deep voice captured Trino's attention. He raised his head and watched Montoya begin reading from a slim white book. His poem was a blend of Spanish and English, words of the Vario people. Why must our words blow across streets covered with blood of our hermanos? Scratched into prison walls, spray painted on fences, our words are hollow markings. Montoya's chin came up, giving a full view of his bumpy face. He stopped reading out of the book, but he kept on saying the poem as if the words were conversation between him and everyone in the room. He spoke about his neighbors in the barrio, described their suffering in such a way that Trino saw his own life. As Montoya chanted, La palabra, la palabra, the word, the word, until his voice was merely a whisper. Trino's mind echoed the words. Then there was clapping, and suddenly Trino shook his head to clear the sound of Montoya's voice out of it. He looked at Lasana, who nodded her head as she clapped too. Montoya read another poem that Trino didn't like much. It was filled with names of people he didn't know. Then another poem followed, one about riding from farm to farm to pick potatoes and onions that made Trino feel angry. Then Trino discovered Montoya's sense of humor as he read a poem called Huevos Diaz about the mornings he and his brother went out to steal eggs from the hens without getting 
pecked or caught by a farmer's shotgun. And he read a poem about the wisdom of his grandparents that he called Abuelos. Another poem that he called Raspa reruns described his memories of eating cold, red snow cones. Only the memory had come when Montoya was lying in a prison bunk, sweating out the hot summer. Trina looked over the room as everyone clapped again. The book lady was all smiles, probably glad there were customers to buy her books today. Lasana said something to Janie, then looked over her shoulder at Trino. Isn't his poetry amazing? Lasana said, leaning backwards so he could hear her. If she thought he liked it, she might expect him to read a poetry book. So Trino just said, it's different from stuff in school. Isn't that the best part? Lasana said before she turned away. Montoya did his next poem in Spanish. His words were musical, like gentle tunes on a guitar as he paid tribute to his brother who had died in a war but whose body was never found. How does somebody stand up in front of strangers and spill his guts so easily? Montoya wasn't so smart even if he was a college teacher. Never let them know where to stick the knife. Trina had learned that lesson a long time ago. Okay, last pages here. The poem stopped for a while as people in the room started asking Montoya's question. One weird guy who didn't even know how to buy a shirt with matching sleeve asked something about finding inspiration. Montoya merely shrugged his shoulders and said, I find my inspiration everywhere. I can't tell you where to find yours. Do you think anyone can write poetry? Lasana had asked the question and didn't seem to care when all the adults stared at her. Montoya's dark eyes set upon Lasana a moment before he said, poetry is about feelings. If you know how to feel, then you can write poetry. Dumb answer, Trino thought. Lots of things I feel bad about, but I never write a poem. But Lasana smiled as if she liked the answer. Montoya lifted his little white book then and said, I'd like to read a poem for the young people. Your lives make for the best poetry because... That's where the raw stuff is, the real emotions that make life worth the fight. Yeah, right, Trino mumbled, <laughs> bending his knees to his chest to rest his arm across them. This poem is called Devil's Own, Montoya said. I wrote it when I was 18. Little brother, I got to keep running from people who don't care if I live or die. I got to keep running, splitting, spitting dirt, sweating from the inside out. I never asked for this sorry kind of life. I never wanted the devil chewing on my heels. He's biting through bones and blood. I got to keep running. As Montoya read the rest of the poem, Trino was surprised to hear his life echoed in the words. I wonder if Montoya's devil has a rat face too, he thought. 